for another piece of uh, political analysis and commentary unlike what you'll get anywhere else in this great nation. And today's topic, uh, I know I mentioned it last week and I, I really wanted to delve into it this week, is the battle between the new school Republicans and the old school Republicans. There is a battle, make no, quest, no mistake about it, no question about it, there is a battle going on within the GOP right now between uh, those conservatives, uh, well, I shouldn't call them conservatives really, but those Republicans who have been around for the last 20 years, who have looked for little more than uh, just to stay in power and to win elections and to do whatever is necessary to do that, a battle between that group of people and an emerging new group of conservatives, typified by the Tea Party and typified by some younger uh, followers and, and some younger folks who are uh, have some libertarian philosophies in there as well. And that's the battle that's going on between within the party now, and you're going to see that uh, really play out over the next year or so, I believe, through the uh, uh, you know, 2012 presidential campaign. It'll be most interesting to see. So I wanted to examine that a little bit and uh, kind of set the stage for you so you can follow that over the next 18 months or so. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is, first of all, let's define who, who the new right is, the, the new school conservatives. And I consider myself to be a member of that group. Uh, who is the new school? Who is the new right? Who are the modern conservatives? Well, one misconception that is out there, that the media has put out there, the left has put out there, uh, is that this emerging Tea Party movement, this emerging new conservatism, is strictly a reaction to the election of Barack Obama. That suddenly all of this just popped up overnight because Barack Obama was elected president. There's even some people on the left and some people in the media, in media who would intimate that this explosion is simply because Obama is an African American. Now, uh, such a characterization of the right is not only grossly incorrect, uh, so so two dimensional, so two dimensional that I don't even know how you can uh, take it seriously. But it's also massively insulting. There is much more to this than just Barack Obama showing up and sitting in the White House. Uh, this is really the culmination of something that's been coming for about 20 years. Now, it's something that hasn't really been talked about in the media or that really hasn't uh, made it to the national stage, but I'll tell you that even you know, during the, the George W. Bush years, or even in the mid-1990s, when, when you would go to a barber shop or a you know, diner or, or any number of places where just average Americans would, would talk about politics and world events, even people who were uh, generally would vote Republican when they voted, they would still have some misgivings about what was going on. And, you know, they'd hear things like George W. Bush throwing a bunch of money at Africa for AIDS, and they'd be like, why is he doing that? You know, or they'd hear about, you know, massive spending in education, and they, what? That's not what we voted for. So, so there was very much a fiscal conservative undercurrent within the grassroots level of the conservative community for the last couple of decades that never really made it to the surface, never really made it to light, that the Republican Party could kind of keep us in check, effectively tell us what we wanted to hear at election time, and hope we would go away. And, and in large measure, well, we did. Uh, and, and I'm pointing the finger of blaming myself for that as much as I am anybody else. Uh, you know, we, we as the grassroots conservatives took our eye off the ball for about 20 years. But slowly but surely, we started to see that things were, were amiss. And really that ramped up in 2008 with the presidential election. And, you know, I, I think that all, all new conservatives probably have their own moment of, of clarity or their moment of reality when they realized something significant had to change in this country. I can't speak for what everybody else's moment like that was, but I'll tell you what mine was. It was back in 2008 when there's an ongoing presidential election and George W. Bush is sitting in the White House and we're hearing all this stuff about big banks potentially failing and all that. And Bush utters the word bailout for the first time and proceeds to, to make the case that we need to bail these banks out because they're too big to fail. And in the midst of this, there's an election going on or a campaign going on between Barack Obama and John McCain, both of which are, you know, tearing each other limb from limb on the campaign trail. But even at that, both of them effectively agreed with George W. Bush, albeit in different ways, 
You know, Obama was in favor of some kind of a bailout, although he wanted to do it in massively different ways, and certainly once he actually got into office, just pour gasoline on the fire with his version of a bailout. But even John McCain wasn't willing to stand up and say no bailout. He stopped his campaign, went back to Washington to, to try and help the bill go through, which he ultimately did. And while all of this was happening, a sitting president and two opposing presidential candidates all having some level of agreement on the need for a bailout, there were still polls and, and uh, you know, that kind of thing, research coming out that showed a, a majority of the American people were against any kind of bailout. And for me personally, that's what put it at the point of saying, wait a second, we've got an entire Washington establishment in both parties that have completely lost touch with what the, what the American people are telling you you need to do. They're telling us we need a bailout. We're telling you, screw the bailout, let them fail. Well, our voices weren't heard, were they? And you can't blame one party or the other for that. You know, one of them just wanted to drive us off the cliff a little bit faster, but they both effectively agreed on some level on something that, that most of the American people thought was deplorable. That was the flashpoint for me that really made me believe that this really is Washington versus America. And so this Tea Party movement, this new conservatism, really was an effort to nip that in the bud, to really take control of our political process back. It was a call to action for regular conservatives to get back into the fray, to begin following what Congress and the politicians do on a daily basis, to get involved in the primary process, because quite frankly, the emergence of John McCain as a candidate is proof that we took our eye off the ball. Most of us couldn't stand the guy. I, I joked to someone before the election that, yeah, I'll vote for McCain, but I'll have to do a couple of shots of Jack Daniels before I go to the polling place. And it, it, it was just one of those things that told you that you know, you got this dangerous socialist in Barack Obama running for the presidency, and the guy you have opposing him is, well, just a little less of a socialist. Is there any more clear, any more of a clear picture that the train had gone off the rails? Well, for many of us in the new right, there wasn't. We knew something was wrong. We knew that it was time to get this nation back to a methodology of fiscal conservatism. It's not about, and never has been with the new right, about power for the sake of power or winning elections just for the sake of winning elections or having some artificial majority of R's versus D's in the, in the Congress. This was about fiscal responsibility. This was about using the same judgments that each of us make in our personal households to run our lives about having the government do the same thing. This was indeed about the entire concept of taking a step back and questioning the role of government to begin with. Looking back at the 20th century and saying, you know what? We got used to government involvement then, but it really didn't work out so well, did it? So it was a shift from just being told what we wanted to hear to actually taking an active role and focusing on that fiscal conservatism. Now, one of the questions that surrounds the new right is the idea of social conservatism. Are, is, is that still a player in the new right? Have, have the fiscal conservatives overtaken the social conservatives? Or, as some critics would say, is it just a new disguise for the social conservatives? I've heard both explanations coming from our critics, and I would say it's neither one. I believe that, first of all, a lot of the old social conservatives and, and the Republican Party for the last 20 years has been based off of a lot of what we used to call single-issue voters. Generally, the single issue is abortion. And the majority of decisions made by those old Republicans were, uh, in terms of the grassroots, were uh, about whether a candidate was you know, pro-life or, or pro-abortion. And if you were pro-life, you almost could get away with whatever else on another uh, topic or an, another, uh, another issue because at least you're pro-life. And, and I grew up in a rural part of the country uh, back in the 1980s where I, I remember distinctly that that was the issue. And if you said you were pro-life, then they'd allow about anything else. That's what has changed. It's not to say that, that we don't believe in, in uh, being anti-abortion or pro-life. I believe a majority of the new right is a pro-life group, but 
it's no longer the only issue. It's one of a myriad of important issues now. And so really, some people have said that the social conservatives are now taking a back seat to the fiscal conservatives. I don't believe that to be the case. But at the same time, the social conservatives are no longer driving the car. The social conservatives are over there in the passenger seat. They're helping us navigate. They're watching the road with us. Uh, but they're not a backseat driver. They're a part of this process too. It is the fiscal conservatives now driving the car, mind you, and I think mean, it's a positive thing, but social conservatism is not gone. Most of us in this new conservative movement have at least some background, uh, not necessarily with religion, but, but at least you know, being raised in the Judeo-Christian ethic. Uh, a lot of uh, the, the younger conservatives have gone through maybe parochial schools. Or, or were raised up in, in a church environment. They might not be active churchgoers now, a lot of them, but they at least based most of their moral principles on Judeo-Christian ethics. So really, I don't believe it's a one versus the other situation of fiscal versus social conservatives. I believe they intermill together fine. Now, you will see, as time goes on, I believe, uh, some younger uh, conservatives move away from the social conservative side, and. So issues like gay marriage uh, you know, might not be as huge of an issue to future Republicans as they are to some of the older Republicans now. But really, even when you take that difference into account, you know, most of those issues are not huge enough issues to most of us that it would cause a, a big chasm within the party. Uh, you know, I, for one, am against gay marriage, but you know, really, am, am I going to refrain from supporting a candidate because they're for gay marriage? Well. Not if they're right on the other issues, not if they're right on the important issues. If they're right on fiscal conservatism, if they're right on protecting our borders, then you know what? I'll, you want to be for gay marriage? Fine, whatever. I might not like it, but frankly, it, it's an issue that doesn't crack my top 10 uh, of my top 10 issues or even my top 20. It's a prioritization of issues and a reprioritization of those issues. So social conservatism is not dead. It has a very... Uh, profound part in the new conservative movement, but it's no longer the whole story.